This is the first part of a um, four-part series on different types of competition. We'll be um, looking at just some introductory concepts and then focusing on perfect competition. Normal profit. It's important to know this definition well. It's the level of profit sufficient to keep a firm in its present use. When we look at it graphically, it's going to look as if there's zero profit, but there's a certain amount of profit built into the cost curve or the supply curve for opportunity costs. So in a nutshell, a normal profit is sufficient profit to keep the, bis the, the firm in um, operation. When drawing revenue and cost curves for industry, it's really important to remember the following. The shape of the average cost curve, that MC crosses AC at the minimum. And very important to remember that firms will produce where MC equals MR to maximize profit or minimize losses. So as a reminder to focus on MC equaling MR, you may hear me refer to M&Ms, the candies, for the MC to equal MR. Revenue is simply how much money has been gained. It's price times quantity. Profit is different though. Profit is that we look at the money in or the revenue and we subtract the costs. Accounting profit, uh, we don't really deal with in economics, but just to so you realize what the difference is, it's the total revenue minus accounting cost. These are the explicit costs or money that you actually had to pay out of pocket for different things like wages, rent, utilities, raw materials, and so on. So it's the payments made to a firm to outsiders in order to acquire resources for use in production. Economic profit, as many of the asterisks, it's the total revenue minus economic costs, and it's the economic costs that we deal with in economics. That's the total opportunity cost incurred by a firm for use of resources, whether purchased or self-owned. So this will be the explicit costs that you had to pay out of pocket and the implicit costs of using resources that you own that you could have sold or rented out to other people. Super normal profit, you'll hear um, being referred to, also known as abnormal profit, that's going to be the profit that's over and above normal profits. And you'll see all of um, the super normal profits and, and normal profits and so on once we get into um, the curves looking at the different types of comp competition. So we did say early on in this unit that the main goal for firms is to maximize profit. But there, I also want you to realize that there might be other goals for, that firms have. They might be interested in revenue maximization. And this is where you're re, uh, maximizing the total amount of revenue that, that you've earned. Sales are often easier to measure than profits and can be used to motivate employees. We see rewards for managers and employees, and they're often based on sales. They don't usually look at the monthly sales and then calculate what the monthly profit is to then uh, to give rewards, although that can be the case. But more often for sales employees, it's based on what the sales revenue is. A firm might also have um, a goal to maximize growth. They might want to achieve economies of scale down the road. They might want to diversify into different products or markets. They might want greater market power and more influence over price. They may be interested in something called managerial utility or satisfaction. Things like increased salaries, larger fringe benefits, more staff, favored projects, and so on. So you could see this with, let's say, a department uh, leader who, who is uh, seeking to, to maximize um, such things. We might see something called satisfying firm behavior, which is a multiplicity of objectives from many separate groups within the firm. So there might be many different objectives that aren't necessarily the same. They might be in conflict or not. And there could, of course, be ethical and environmental concerns. The avoidance of polluting activities, engaging in environmentally sound practices, support for human rights, the arts, athletics, donations to charity, and so on. Here's some advice for drawing the cost and revenue curves, which will make much more sense once we get into the process of actually drawing them. 
We want to first establish where we're going to maximize profit or minimize losses, and we're going to produce where MC equals MR, the M&Ms. In other words, where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Once you've established this quantity Q, where MC equals MR, then you can forget about MC and MR. Focus then on the average cost curve and the average revenue curve to establish any profit or loss. So we're going to look at the case study of perfect competition and the market for cucumbers. If you can go through um, and read the following slides and pause the video if you need more time. So let's look at some of the characteristics of perfect competition. Look at the number of sellers. The number of sellers is very high. Let's look at something called barriers to entry, to entry and exit. So in other words, is it very difficult to get into this market? Do you have to sink a lot of money up front to get into the market? Once you've established yourself, can you easily exit from the market? And the answer to this is that the barriers are very low. It's a very easy market to get into. Are you a price maker or a price taker? You're definitely a price taker. It's very di difficult to establish a price that's other than what the market price is. Um, and product differentiation. So they, um, they're ident we're dealing with identical products. Basically a cucumber is a cucumber. And in terms of, um, the size of the firms, we've got, um, no one firm or seller can influence the market. So perfect competition occurs when market forces dictate the price and output levels of each firm. So the structure, we'll just go over this quickly. We've gone over a lot of this already. The number of firms are large or even infinite, you could say. And so each firm's output is um, very small in relation to the size of the market. The firms, because there's so many of them, they cannot collude and get together and fix either quantity or price. And the firms act independently of each other. As we discussed, no one buyer or seller can influence the market. And we have free entry and exit, though the barriers to entry are very low. And this is also important to realize. There's perfect knowledge among all firms and consumers. So if one firm is doing particularly well and having um, higher um, revenue than, than others. Uh, everyone will know. Uh, there are no secrets. Product differentiation, we talked about them being identical or homogeneous. And the market power, all firms are price takers and the consumer is sovereign. Pricing and output policies. Um, as we said, the firms are price takers and they have no control over price. And the price charged by the firm is the same as the price charged by the industry. So we're going to see that there's going to be a horizontal demand curve. We'll look at this in a few slides. And price is constant as output varies. So if we look at, first of all, the industry, in terms of industry demand and the industry supply curve, we would have a market equilibrium price. 
what happens for um, the firm now is that we're going to take this price and it's going to become the price and the demand curve for the firm. So as quantity increases, we see that the price remains constant. So the price elasticity of the firm in perfect competition we say is perfectly elastic. So just a reminder if you forgot the little trick to remember if it's perfectly elastic or inelastic, if I added an extra bar up here that looks like an E and hence um, elastic. If a firm were to charge more, so if the firm charged up here, the consumers will buy from other firms. Remem remember there's um, an infinite number of firms or, or a great number of firms. There's perfect knowledge, so people know that other firms are producing at a lower price, and the good is identical, so why would they buy from you? You wouldn't charge less, because with an elastic demand curve, and remember, you're small relative to the whole market, so the elastic demand curve also means that you can sell as much as you like at the market price. So um, there would be no reason to charge less, because you're interested in maximizing profits. Total revenue, when uh, price elasticity of demand equals infinity. The curve, um, oh sorry, if the price of the good was $5, we would have, for instance, at an output of seven, our total revenue would be 35. If we had an output of 10, then the to total revenue would be 50 and so on. So it would be a straight line um, total revenue curve originating from the origin. So let's say, hypothetically, if our smart board markers were um, a product in perfect competition. Of course they aren't. Um, they're not all identical and, and there's not an infinite number of firms, but for an ease of, of demonstration in the classroom, it's easy to pick up a marker and a second marker and a third marker. But we're going to assume that the price per marker is $2 each. So if I asked you, and I don't mean to to uh, insult you, but if I ask you what is the price of the marker, you would tell me $2. And if I asked you what's the average revenue if you sold five markers, well the average revenue is going to be $2. And what is the revenue for the sixth marker sold? Well the marginal revenue is $2. So when we look at the horizontal demand curve, which we know is price, which equals the demand curve. This also equals the marginal revenue, which was $2. It also equals the average revenue. Now this is the only type of competition where this is the case, is the perfect competition. Here it is, professionally drawn. You'll see that, again, you're going to produce where MC equals MR. And at that point, you have your quantity. Once you've determined the quantity, you see what's happening with revenue and cost. And you have revenue equals the cost. And you have the normal profit only. Now, this is what's known as the long run equilibrium in perfect competition. So in other words, in the long run, you can only have normal profits in perfect competition. The break-even price, that's the price that's equal to the minimum of the average total cost, and it's called the break-even price. And this is where total revenues are equal to its total costs. And that's also the same place that you see the firm operating in the long run equilibrium in perfect competition. Perfect competition in the long run now. Um, so in the short run, the number of firms in an industry cannot change because each firm has at least one fixed resource, which it cannot vary. In the long run, though, all of the firm's resources are variable. So the number of firms in the industry is no longer unchanging. New firms can enter the industry. Existing firms can change their plant size, increase or decrease their fixed resources or firms can liquidate and sell their fixed resources and leave the industry altogether. There is therefore free entry and exit of firms in the industry. 
which is one of the characteristics of this market structure. Suppose now that there's a change in consumer taste in favor of the product produced in this industry. The industry demand curve shifts to the right where the market price increases, which of course becomes the new price that firms in the industry now accept. Firms therefore begin to earn short-run economic profit. So just as a reminder, let's see what's happening with the industry. Quantity and price in a downward sloping demand curve because this is industry, not the firm. We've got supply, and this would be P1. And if the industry supply curve shifts to the right, we get D2. And price has indeed increased. So we're going to show this in, um, in the case of perfect competition uh, for, for showing profits. So now we have an increase in price, the horizontal demand curve, which equals price, which equals marginal revenue, which equals average revenue. The price has risen above the minimum of average cost. We need to add in our marginal cost, the minimum. We, of course, are going to produce where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So here is the marginal cost. Here is the marginal revenue. That becomes our production decision. Once we've established Q, we're going to focus on revenues and cost. So in terms of intersecting with average revenue, we know that all of this must be the revenue. But at this quantity, where we see it, it intersects with average cost, which is here, we bring this over, and this becomes our cost, and revenue minus cost will be our supernormal profit. supernormal, or you might hear the term abnormal profit. And this is possible in the short run only, which we'll investigate in just a minute. So here it is professionally drawn. Again, um, you see that the price received is, is above the minimum of average cost. We look again at where MC equals MR to determine the quantity. Once you have the quantity, then go up and see what is the revenue. And we go up to average cost and see what is the cost. And we see that the difference between revenue and cost is the abnormal profits or supernormal profits. In the long run, the increased profit realized by firms in the industry leads to the new entry of firms into the industry which are attracted by the prospect of making economic profits. So remember, in this type of um, competition, being perfect competition, there's perfect knowledge. So everybody knows what's happening and, and if their supernormal profits are being made. So if we have new entrants entering the industry, we have the industry supply curve that shifts to the right, we have output in the industry increases, and it and continues to shift right until the market price has fallen back to the level of P1, where all firms are earning normal profit once again. So on the next slide, we'll, we'll look at that phenomenon. So first of all, we're looking at the industry. So we have an industry demand curve, and an industry supply curve. And at this point, we saw at P1, which becomes over here, demand curve that there were supernormal profits. So again, this is P equals D equals marginal revenue equals average revenue. This is the average cost. Comes the marginal cost. And we know in this scenario, we had supernormal profits. What happens though, is that the supply curve with new people entering the market shifts to the right, so we have S1, 
now we have S2. This is, and this becomes P2. At this new demand curve, P equals D equals MR equals AR, we return to normal profit only. So the firm that was once earning supernormal profits returns to normal profits only. So in the event that the market demand curve were to fall, the market demand curve would shift to the left, price would fall, and firms would begin to incur losses. The long-run response will be for firms to leave the industry. The industry supply curve will shift to the left up to the point that price climbs back to its original position, where it's equal to a firm's minimum average total cost, and the industry's output will be reduced. So let's just look at um, the first situation if market demand were to fall. So here we're looking at the industry quantity and price demand supply. So if the demand curve were to fall, decrease, we would be going from P1 to P2. In terms of how this would look for the firm, and we'll draw this in a few slides um, as well with more detail, but we would have quantity and cost for revenue and at the new price, well, we'll show the old, yes, so the, show the first the original price at P1. We have the firm that's breaking even. Marginal cost and demand equals price equals marginal revenue equals average revenue. So here we have the firm breaking even, but if we have a, a fall in price to P2, we will at this point produce where M and M, M MC equals MR. So this would be our production decision. This would be our Q. And all of this would be revenue. Whereas all of this would be cost. And that would be our loss. But don't worry that we'll be looking at this in two slides. So just to reiterate what would then happen with the loss is that the industry supply curve would shift to the left because people would um, enter, excuse me, exit the market with seeing a loss. The price would go back up and the price would go up to the point where there was normal profit only again. So if we had changes in technology or resource prices, again, looking at the long run equilibrium. So if there's an improvement in the technology of production or if resource prices change, we know that the cost curves will, will change. An improvement in technology or, or fall in resource prices means lower costs for the firm. And so we would have the firm's supply curves, excuse me, the industry supply curves shifting to the right. Um, I'm sorry, looking at the firm, my apologies. The, um, there'd be a downward shift in the firm's cost curve. This means that firms that were previously earning only normal profit will now be earning economic profit or supernormal profit. This will result in new entrance into the industry. The industry supply curve will shift to the right. And when it does so, the market prices begin to fall and the supply curve will keep shifting um, and the price falling until the new market price is equal to the new lower minimum ATC curve, intersected at its minimum point by the new lower marginal cost curve. The end result will be that output of the industry will increase, the final market price will be lower, and all firms will be earning normal profit once again. If resource prices were to increase, there would be an upward shift in the firm's cost curves, and the final equilibrium for the industry would involve a lower quantity of output produced and a higher equilibrium price. So let's look at um, the case where we have short run loss. Okay, so let's just draw the scenario. 
let's draw demand curve, which is price, which equals marginal revenue, which equals average revenue. And now we have to have our cost curve higher than this. Average cost. Add into here marginal cost. And we know we're going to produce where MC equals MR. So MC equals MR at this point. This becomes our Q decision. Once we know where we're producing at Q, we look at then average revenue and average cost. So we know that all of this will be the revenue box. And if we continue up to average cost and bring it over, we know that all of this will be the cost. And if the cost exceeds the revenue, we know that this will be the loss. And there it is for you in color. Shutdown position. Okay, we looked at the when we looked at the margin. Excuse me, the marble lemonade stand. We knew that you would shut down if your average variable cost was not being met by your revenues or your average revenue. So in this case, for a shutdown position, where we will throw in the towel, call it a day. Our average total cost is going to be up here. Our average variable cost will be there. We'll bring marginal cost through the minimum. And you're going to shut down because here, since your average variable cost is not being met by your revenues, for every, if we were selling glasses of lemonade, for every glass of lemonade, you would have to go out and buy more sugar, more lemons, more cups, more distilled water, and you'd be going further and further in debt, and there'd be no sense of carrying on. Allocative and productive efficiency. You're going to see uh, questions come up in the IB asking you whether certain types of competition are allocatively and productively efficient. So here's a, a reminder of what these are. Competitive markets achieve economic, which is allocative and productive efficiency. It's achieved by perfect competition in its long run equilibrium position, so not necessarily in the short run. So allocative efficiency, it's when firms are producing the particular combination of goods and services that consumers mostly prefer. So we know it's going to be when marginal benefit equals marginal cost. If you're not producing at that point, if marginal benefit exceeds the cost, you know that you're going to want to keep producing because you're missing out on some additional benefit. If you've produced beyond the point where MC is now greater than marginal benefit, then society is not happy. The cost now exceeds the benefit that they're getting for this good. So MB equals MC is the key point, but we also know that marginal benefit is nothing more than price. So we can restate the condition as price equals marginal cost. Productive efficiency means that firms produce at the lowest possible cost. And the condition for productive efficiency is when price is at the minimum of average total cost. And in other words, production of this good uses up the least amount of resources possible. So perfect competition, it's the only market structure where allocative and productive efficiency are realized. And remember, this is in the long run situation. So productive efficiency, if I were to ask, is price at the quantity you're producing this equal marginal um, cost? And the answer is yes. We also look at, um, are we producing at the minimum of average total cost? And the answer is yes. So we see that it's both productively and allocatively efficient. So evaluating perfect competition. So with allocative efficiency, 
we know that perfect competition leads to the best or optimal allocation of resources uh, for society based on the mix of goods and services that consumers mostly want. And again, P, sorry about this, P equals MC in the long run equilibrium. Productively efficient. We know it also leads to production at the lowest possible cost, avoiding waste in the use of resources. We're producing at the minimum of ATC. In perfect competition, there's low prices for consumers due to one, the production at the lowest possible co cost, and two, the absence of economic profits, which have led to a higher price. We also know that competition leads to closing down of inefficient producers. <clears throat> the market responds to consumers' tastes. So changes in consumers' tastes are reflected in changes in the market demand and therefore market price. By creating short-run economic profits or losses, price changes results in long-run adjustments that make the quantity of output produced by the industry respond to consumer tastes. Also, the market responds to changes in technology or resource prices. So if there's an improvement in the technology of production or a change in resource prices, the cost curves will shift upwards or downwards, leading to economic profits or losses, once again leading to new long-run equilibrium that will accommodate the changes. And this assignment will also be given in a handout, um, but these are the questions um, should you uh, not be able to access the handout. Thank you.